All right, if I could have your attention, we will get the day started. My name is Chip Poland. I'm chair of the Department of Ag and Technical Studies, and this is one of two days that we really enjoy within the department. I, I, you know, graduation is good, spring and fall, but this particular program, Opportunities in Agriculture, as well as our celebration of scholars in the spring, is an opportunity for our graduating students or soon to be graduating students to uh, provide a, a public forum for, for them to present their senior projects. And it's a day that we certainly look forward to. Um, this one, uh, as much as any of the rest. Um, this particular one in the fall, we've taken the last 10 years to provide a, uh, an umbrella of talking about opportunities in agriculture. So our students have an opportunity to talk about what, what they've been working on. Um, we have a, uh, we ask vendors to come to give our students as well as others an opportunity to see what kind of job opportunities there are for students that are studying agriculture. We have a whole host of alumni in the back of the room. If you wouldn't know that, it, it's another part of this being a great day. And then we try to provide an opportunity for a keynote speaker to come and give us a, a message about some opportunity that might be within, within agriculture. The one that we have today is especially special, especially special for me, I suppose. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, we were midterms in problems in livestock. We had an opportunity to, I gave them a, a list of things that Beef Magazine had sort of um, indicated were important things with respect to production in beef, um, the beef industry and asked them to prioritize and somewhat why they felt one thing was better than another. And then NCBA had put out a, a, a list of six or seven goals that they felt the beef industry needed to work on in the, in the near term. We asked the, I asked the students to prioritize those as far as, and, and to give some ex explanation on why they felt some were more important than others, and to identify two of those that um, they felt somebody from North Dakota would be able to, uh, to work on in terms of a national strategy of what the beef industry needed to do. And almost invariably, all of them decided that one thing they could do would be to help speak out and explain agriculture to a, a, a non-rural population. I was pretty excited then when we were able to, to get Jackie Christman to come to us to talk about her perspective in terms of, of agriculture in, in Western Dakotas. How do you get in? You know, is it possible to come to a place like Dickinson State, rodeo for a bit, go home and get into production, agriculture, raise a family, and take an opportunity to reach out into social media and begin to tell the story of agriculture as it is in Western North Dakota. So with that, we've asked Jackie to come and give us her perspectives on opportunities for students here in Western North Dakota. Help me welcome Jackie to the podium. Hello everybody, um, this is the first time I've ever been a keynote speaker, so if I look nervous it is because I am. Um, I was quite honored and surprised when Annika called me about nine months ago to ask me if I'd be willing to do this. I, so I said, yeah, I, you know, I could probably do something. I said, you want about 15 minutes? And she's like, oh no, like an hour. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and so when I told my husband about this, he said, why would they ask you? And so I'm, that is why my mother's here with me and not my husband. That's how much she, I guess, believes in me. Uh, to get a whole hour into this, I decided to start from the very beginning. I was born and raised in Harding County, South Dakota. For those that don't know where that is, it's in the northwest corner of South Dakota. That red dot is my folks' ranch. And let me see if I can get this to work. I don't know. Anyways, if you can see up there, there's a town of Buffalo. That's where I went to school. It was 27 miles from the ranch to Buffalo, rode a bus every day, five days a week, until we could drive ourselves. There's 380 people in Buffalo. There's another town called Camp Crook. That was 17 miles away, but there's like 50 people. So we lived in a very small community. It was a wonderful community, wonderful people. I love Harding County. I still consider it my home. My folks were ranchers. There wasn't a whole lot of farming in this area. As you can see, it's pretty rough country. That one place is called the Jump Off. We had a lot of 
land in that area. So we did, we did a lot of things um, just with livestock. Um, uh, this is a perfect couple. I kind of joke about that because they do argue a lot. But this is my folks. They both were raised in Hardin County. My mom was up in the Cave Hills, which is kind of by Ludlow, which is closer to the North Dakota border. And my dad moved to Hardin County when he was one years old. My, my grandparents moved that family back to Hardin County. And so these two have uh, started it all for us. They got married while they were in college and came home and bought the, the farmstead they live on now, or the homestead they live on now. It was my dad's mom's operation. So they came back and they started ranching together. This is my, this is my grandpa Stanley Price. I honestly thought he walked on water. He was the best man I've ever met. He was born in 1917 in Opal, South Dakota. So he was a teenager during the Great Depression, the Dirty Thirties. He was the second oldest, the oldest boy out of his family. And his folks kind of just told him, you need to go find other jobs. Like, you can't, we can't afford to feed you all. So as a teenager, he went off on his own and started working for different ranchers in the area. And he was just an incredible man, incredible hard worker. He um, ended up in Harding County working for a rancher out there, and that's how he met my grandma Clara. He went to college, went to SDSU, graduated from SDSU, something that not a lot of people um, in that time did. He was also a really good saddle bunk rider, pro rodeoed, went a lot all over the country pro rodeoing. And then World War II happened, and he got enlisted into the war. A couple years after being in the war, he was shot in the knee and was honorably discharged. While in the war, he got the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star. He was just a man that was above everybody else. I really, really had a lot of respect for my grandpa. He was also very involved. So when he moved back to Harding County, he had sheep, cattle, and horses. A lot of people back then didn't have the sheep, but he had all three, and he bought all the hay. There wasn't a whole lot of hay country, and he didn't believe, and he thought he was cheaper if he could buy hay instead of putting up hay. He was also very involved. He was the president of the school board. He was either the secretary or the treasurer of the National Wool Growers Association. Um, he traveled all over going to meetings and stuff. Uh, the second picture here, they just got done shipping some lambs. And one of the guys is a lamb buyer. He was also the calf buyer. And he had bought cat. Him and my grandpa worked every year selling calves and lambs over the phone. No contract was needed. It was just by their word of mouth, and it worked out really, really well for both of them. He was just somebody that if he said he, could, he would do it, it would be done. So he was probably I, still one of the greatest men I've ever met. Uh, here I am as a baby. I really don't have much to say other than I was pretty cute. It didn't, <laughs> didn't last very long. So, And that was me on a horse with my older sister. Like I said, we were riding horses before we were walking. Here is my siblings. There was four of us. Um, I had an older sister, a little sister, and a younger brother. We were all born in the 80s. Uh, for those people that remember the 80s, they were a very, very tough time. We would never have known that. My folks um, worked incredibly hard to make sure we didn't know that we were broke, but <laughs> I think we were pretty broke. But they made sure we had three meals a day. We had our freezers were always full. We had a garden. Um, they did all their butchering and processing themselves. And so we, my grandpa had turkeys, goose, chickens. We bought hogs from a local guy, and then we had lamb and beef. And so we always had food on the table. We always wore hand-me-downs. Um, we really learned early where our food came from, and we always helped with the process of getting it on the table. Uh, my folks were both ranchers. They both worked from home. My mom did all the cleaning, the laundry, the cooking. She did the night checking and she took care of us kids growing up, and my dad was outside all the time. He lived outside. He was a very hardworking, always was improving what we had. They were wonderful role models. When we got bigger, we went with my dad, and mom would keep the younger ones. And then once we all got bigger, we all just went outside and worked. So, like I said, our life was beautiful. I loved it. Growing up outside and on a ranch was just couldn't have asked for a better lifestyle and a childhood. We were at my grandpa grandparents a lot. Their ranch was about five, six miles cross country from my folks' place, and my dad and mom went there almost daily doing all their chores. We calved, we lamb there. So we were between the two places. 
we just rode horses a lot. We helped with lamb and calving. It was a really, really good childhood. Uh, so when I say we had horses, I mean we had a lot of horses. We had probably about 50 horses at all times. And my dad, he went to some clinics when he was younger and learned how the proper way to train a horse. Um, so we had these double round crails. I don't know, it's kind of hard to see. They've been rebuilt a couple times. So in the middle round crail, we would start the horse. And then once they're ready, we'd go them out in the outside of the alleyway. And then there was an arena connected to it. And then we'd go right out to the arena when they were ready. And so at a very young age, we learned how to train our own horses. On the top right, I am on Tom, and my, my older sister's on Jerry. These were two-year-old horses that my dad picked for us to start on our own. These are the first horses we've ever started. I was pretty proud of myself. I got off the bus and I ran down to the barn because we knew we were going to get to ride the horses for the very first time. It went off really well, huge confidence builder. It wasn't too many years ago that I found out my dad had actually rode both those horses a few times <laughs> and didn't want to tell us about it. But So he was... He made sure we learned how to take care of our horses, how to train horses, but he was always making sure that we were gonna be okay. I really enjoyed the process of training a horse from the start. My, older, my sisters were better in the arena, training arena horses. I was a little better at training uh, one from the get-go. I do remember one time Dad and I were going out to riding these horses for the very first time outside, and my dad asked me if I was scared, if I was nervous, and of course I was, and I had the butterflies, and I'm sure the horse was nervous because anything could happen. They could spook and run and go through a fence or buck me off, but I'm like, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. He said, well, okay, just remember, fear only fear itself. At the time, I'm like, what does that even mean? But now, as I've gotten older, I understand what he was trying to say, and I use that a lot in my head when I have something big coming on, and it's kind of nerve-wracking, like today. So this is um, just some pictures of us, of me growing up. We did a lot of uh, cattle and sheep work. That's in the middle picture, we're cutting some stud colts. We were expected to work just as much as anybody else would have been. I was pretty lucky that there was three girls and then the boy, because we were just, we were raised like boys. We didn't, um, we taunt post, we rode horses, we calved, we lamb, we did all of it ourselves. Um, my dad was very particular, he still is very particular. If we did something wrong, he would be the first one to tell us that we did wrong. <laughs> and he would drill us how to do it correctly and we'd have to do it over until we did it right. Everything was done on horseback and so we had to learn how to ride a horse, how to sort cattle, how to do both at the same time. I do remember uh, riding horses with dad and we'd be on some good broke horse and he'd be riding a colt and we'd be sorting cows and things would be going haywire and he would make us get off our good horse well <laughs> and jump on our good horse and go do the project then come back and take his colt back from us so it was a good way to learn um, he taught us and so did my mom they taught us at a young age how to work hard not to give up until the job is completed it was a really good childhood in the mid 1990s we started having horse sales and so this is all these pictures are kind of in catalogs at all the previous horse sales. We started in the mid-90s when I was probably 12, 13 years old, and we, the last horse sale we had was 2017, so we'd have a horse sale every three years. It was a lot of work. They took a lot of time. We rode a lot of horses, but this really taught me how to visit with people. I was super shy, and this was a good way for me to get out of my shell. People would come up to me and ask me something about the horse I was riding, or, and it just made me get out and talk to people and do a good job advertising what we were doing. Um, they, they quit doing horse sales because my brother's the only one home right now, and we're just having our own families and just a little too busy. So they're just going to do private treaty, but these horse sales were a lot of fun, not always the most profitable things, but we got rid of a lot of good horses and had a lot of fun doing them. Uh, we did do a lot of work, but we also got to play sports in Harding County. We were very, um, Harding County was a very, I don't know, we very competitive county. So we really worked hard. If we wanted to play sports, mom and dad were very encouraging, but we had to work hard. We had to give it 110%. Um, so we, we enjoyed our sports. I played basketball and volleyball, and of course I rodeoed. Um, we started rodeoing at a very early age. It was one of those things that on our first rodeo, we only rodeoed in the springtime, not like North Dakota, where they do it in the fall and the spring. It was just in the spring. Our horses were usually the most legged up horses in the arena, but we weren't necessarily the most 
practiced kids in the arena, we were calving and lambing, and that always came before um, anything else. So it was good. I enjoyed sports. It taught me a lot how to be competitive, how to play with others. So then I was going to SDSU. I had big plans. Me and two of my best friends were all going there together. I was dating a guy. Of course, you know how that goes. And he was also going East River, South Dakota. And after, sometime that summer, we broke up, and I was heartbroken or something. And my sister was going to DSU. So she said, why don't you come to DSU with me? And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's not even a bad idea. I had visited her a couple times while she was up here, and, and I was in high school, and I really liked it. And I also had a full ride scholarship with the Alice Travers scholarship. So I was like, yeah, this would make way more sense. And that summer, after I switched everything over to DSU, Buck Berger had called me and said, hey, do you want to rodeo for us? And I had been wanting to rodeo for SDSU, but they didn't give me the time of day. So I said, yes, I would love to rodeo. So here I bring up my horses and started my rodeo career in DSU. It was being on the rodeo team was probably the one of the best things I could have done for myself in college. Like I said, I was pretty shy, um, and this was a great way to meet like-minded people. We were, I made some, some of the best friends uh, because of rodeo, and, and I really had a good time. So that first fall, I had some good luck. I made a little money, made some points, and then my sister had given up on rodeo. She didn't have a very good first year, so she started rodeoing too, so we, we would share horses. So we would share the same breakaway horse and the goat tying horse, and we'd have separate uh, barrel racing horses. So we, um, she started rodeoing with me, we got to travel together. First year I did, I was probably in the top 10 in the breakaway roping, that was kind of my event. Second year, at this time I'm just taking all my generals, just trying to get my generals out of the way. I end up being in the top five, and we go to the shootout rodeo in Bozeman. And this is the problem I had in high school. I choked a lot. So I ended up going to a short go at Bozeman to go on to the national finals. And I was one of the last girls to rope. So I was sitting like really, really well. And of course, I come out and miss my calf. And I'm like, well, that, <laughs> there you go. And then on my third year, and now I'm starting to take all my elementary education courses. So I am deep into elementary education at this point. And I come to realize I don't like elementary education. And so instead of just figuring that out and figuring out what I should do, I just quit going to classes. Not a good idea. And so it just so happened that I made it to the, they quit doing the shootout and they just took the top three girls to nationals. So I ended up making it to nationals my third year. And I, Tom Nelson was a rodeo coach at the time and we had this big national meeting, the guys that all got to go. And he's like, Jackie, I need to talk to you. And I'm like thinking, oh, yeah, we've got to visit about what we're going to do. And he's like, uh, I hate to tell you this, but you might not be able to go to nationals. I'm like, oh, why? And he's like, uh, your GPA is so low. I'm like, so that phone call to my folks was probably one of the hardest phone calls I've ever made in my life. Um, my parents were not impressed. But my finals was good enough that I ended up getting to go to, the, um, to nationals. My high, uh, like the classes finals were good enough. And so I went to nationals, had a good time. My mom said, why don't you take a year off, figure out what you really want to do in life. Don't do something that you're never going to enjoy. Like, just figure it out. But I knew myself well enough that if I took a year off, I would not come back. And so at the time, my roommate, one of my good friends, was doing natural resource management. And I actually took more time helping her with her homework than I ever did on my own stuff. So I said, well, maybe that's something I would like to do. So at the time, Gary White was the egg advisory for the egg department, and he, he said, yeah, we can switch you over. That wouldn't be no problem, but it's going to take you six years. I said, well, that ain't going to happen. I said, I don't want to go six years of school for a four-year degree. So I quit rodeo, and I didn't rodeo my fourth year, and I decided just to go on and try to get my natural resource management in five years. I took a lot, a lot of classes. This is before online happened, and so we had to actually be present every time. And so I had to try to fit it all in my schedule. And I, so I was taking over 20 credits every semester. But what I found out is I really liked what I was learning. And it wasn't that bad to go to classes when you actually enjoy what you're learning. I liked my professors. I loved the egg department. Very, it was kind of like Hardin County. You kind of knew everybody. And everybody was friendly. And everybody would help you if you had some problems. So that was really good for me. It was a good switch that I made. My fifth year, I went back to rodeoing. Plus, I was trying to do um, all these classes. But it, it went really well. Uh, at the very end, I was sitting second place to go to nationals in the breakaway roping. The girl ahead of me was so far ahead of me, there was no chance I'd catch her. But 
The girls behind me were very, very close behind me. The way things drew up, I ended up being um, the first girl to rope for the whole weekend. So we thought we had the barrier figured out. I went out, roped my calf, turned around, broke out. And so I never made it back to the show go. The couple girls that were right behind me, one run the rodeo and one got second. So I got to crying hole to go to the finals on my last year of rodeo, which probably was the hardest thing in college is not getting to go to the finals. Um, also at the time, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I still, uh, I, was, I wasn't sure, but they had the NRCS, they had an opening in Hedinger, North Dakota. Don't know much about Hedinger, but it's only a couple, mo a couple hours from my folks' place, so I thought I would, tr I would apply. That was the only job I applied for. Not a good idea either. Um, that was before the oil field hit this part of the world, and so there wasn't a whole lot of jobs out there. I applied, I went home, uh, and then I went back to my folks' house or place for a week or two and then came back to clean out my apartment. I got a letter in the mail and it says, I'm sorry to inform you, you did not get the job. And I'm like, what now? I had went home every summer break, every spring break and worked for my folks, but I did not want that to be a full-time job. So I was pretty miserable to be around for about a month. And then I got a phone call from Gary Gisvold from Dickinson and dad said, I was saddling horses, and dad said, some guy called you from Dickinson. And I said, oh, okay, what do you want? And dad's like, well, I'm not really sure. You're supposed to call him back. I wrote the number down for you. So I go up to the house to figure out what this guy might want, and I called the number, and it was the wrong number. My dad had wrote down the wrong number. And so I spent, I know, way too much time looking for a number. Finally found it. All I knew was his name was Terry, no last name. Finally got, it, got to this Terry, and here he said, hey, I'd like to offer you a job at the NRCS in Hedinger. And I said, well, I think you're confused. I've actually already got turned down for that job. He said, no, 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 this is your job. You got it if you want it. He said, when do you want to start? And I said, well, I'll start tomorrow. And he said, no, no, we got some paperwork to do. So on July 6th of 2006, I started working for the NRCS in Hedinger. I really, really enjoyed the work. I, it was. It was half farming, half ranching. It was really right up my alley. I didn't know a whole lot about farming, but uh, my boss was awesome. He taught me a lot just about no-till and disking and cover crops and soil health. My coworkers were great. I really liked the town of Hedinger. It was a, uh, about 1,200 people. And, but I found myself, I was pretty bored. I worked at 7 in the morning, got done at 4.30, and then I didn't really have much else to do. I didn't have kids, wasn't married. So I started working for the past time one night a week being a bartender. They were a steakhouse and a bar, and so I was here bartending, got to know even more people. I really had a fun time, but at that time I was a term employee, which means I worked for one and a half to three years, and then they wanted, if they liked you, they would uh, move you to a different field office, and if they didn't like you, they could say goodbye without no hurt feelings. Um, to come to find out they liked me, and they were talking about moving me East River to, they wanted their employees well-rounded. What I did not want to go was East River. <laughs> I didn't want to go any farther away from my folks' place, and I definitely didn't want to go just to straight farming. I did like, uh, I'm real big on cattle, so I wanted to stay closer to West River. So Alliance Egg, a guy by the name of Shane Tim, was the boss for the agronomy office there, and he offered me a job, and I, I came right out and told him I know nothing about farming, I know nothing about fertilizer, nothing about chemicals, nothing. And he said, all this I can teach you. He said, it's a lot of on-the-job training. Just come on board, and we'll get it figured out. So I started that job in March of 08, and I went right to filling in hydrous tanks. I filled in hydrous tanks all spring long. It was a lot of work. We started when the first farmer got going in the field, and we didn't quit until the last farmer was done farming. And so we worked seven days a week for about two months and it was a lot of work, but I learned so much. I learned a lot about chemicals, a lot about fertilizer. I also learned how much money it takes to farm. I've never been around farming before, and these farmers would hand me a checkbook and have me fill out the check for them. And I would write money that I would not make in five years. I'd write in one check for them, and that was just part of what they needed to put a crop in the ground. So I was amazed um, the amount of money it took to farm. I also met my husband when I was working there. He was his college kid, so he's like five years younger than me, and he was home every weekend for, from college. He went to Wapaton for farm management, and he, did, he went to college because he knew that would help him out. Nobody asked him to go. Nobody told him to go. He paid his own way, but he was home every single weekend almost and didn't drink, 
didn't party, like completely separate of what I did, by like polar opposites. And he was a super driven guy and he would come back and he would come in to buy chemical and fertilizer. And I was just so impressed how driven, how hard of work and how smart he was. He, it was a really impressive guy. And the guys I was kind of dating still didn't have their lives put together. So and we started dating in that summer of 08. And that's when I kind of actually started growing up. He uh, talked me into getting my first some cows and it was, oh, so I had mom and dad had given me 10 bread heifers when I graduated college, kind of as a present. Thankfully, you graduated college, here's some cows. But I didn't take them. I left them down there. I had no place to go with them. So I said, well, you guys keep them. You keep the calf check. I don't need the money. I don't care, whatever. So Jordan said, why don't you bring cows and you can run cows with me? And I'm like, oh, yeah, good idea. And so I bought 40 short terms from my folks and then kept them 10 cows. So I had 50 cows. It was in 08. Cattle market was bad. I bought my short-term cows for $600 bred cows. And then, so I calved them out that spring in 09. Um, it wasn't really good, but uh, so I asked Jordan, I said, where do we pasture these at? And he said, I don't know where you're gonna pasture yours at. You gotta find pasture. And I'm like, what do you mean? And so he was just that type of person. He would make me go take care of whatever. I mean, he was like, you make the phone calls. So actually a neighbor of ours had just retired so i called him and he uh, had some pasture for me so i was able to run 50 cows about five miles from where we capped him out at it worked out really well also in 09 we moved in a modular home we moved it in a quarter of a mile from his dad's place and i also had plenty of time to still go down and help my folks down at their operation um, yeah so we decided, well, we got engaged in, in 2010, and I decided to go back to the NRCS. The Alliance Egg was great, but it was just really time consuming and getting married and having cattle and helping him farm. I just didn't have the time anymore. So we got married in 2010. I went back to my NRCS job. I worked there, and then we had our first son, Kay Han, and he was born in 2012, the very end of 2012. A few days after he was born, we actually bought our own place. The neighbor, the guys I was telling you about that I leased the land from, they were wanting to get moved out. They wanted to go to Minneapolis. And so they were asking us if we'd buy this place. We weren't really interested. It was a really a lot of money, but we thought if we wanted to have our own life, we needed to get our own place. At this time, we were using a lot of my father-in-law's stuff, his shops, his krells. We would trade work for the use of his stuff it has anybody that's ever worked with in-laws, you know how everybody feels like they got a little bit shafted on the deals. So we, there was a lot of bickering, a lot of hurt feelings. We were only a quarter mile from his place. I didn't, I didn't, it just didn't go great. So I was like, we need our own place. We need a place we can raise our kids. So we bought our place, but they needed to live there for another year and a half before we could get moved over there. And so we had Kay Hannon, and then during maternity leave, I realized there was just no way I was going to go back to work full time. I, this little boy that I had, I fell in love and could not imagine life where I had to work away from him all the time. And I was going back and forth what we should do. And my mom and dad were like, well, of course you got to quit your job. You have a kid. You need to stay at home with him because both my folks stayed at home with us. And, and I still wasn't sure what to do. And my dad said, you know, Jackie, you will do more for your cattle herd than Jordan will ever get done. Jordan has too much on his plate. You'll do a better job. You'll make more money if you stayed at home and just took care of your cows and did a better job running cattle. And he said, the amount of money you guys borrow farming, if you can't set some of that money aside to stay at home, then you guys have some serious problems. And so we just kind of changed a little bit the way that we lived and was able to, I was able to stay at home. And then we had City 17 months later, something else I would not recommend. <laughs> They were very close. I do not remember her first year of her life. Um, so I was really busy. And then Conway, the baby, was born in 2016. And then I decided that was enough kids. And um, yeah, so this is our place. The, so in 2000, or like January of 2014, we started gutting out the basement or the walk-in basement of our house. They were living upstairs. The basement was, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a beautiful place, but it was really, really old and outdated. It hadn't been touched since the 70s, so there was a lot of shade carpeting, things that I just didn't really care for. So we completely gutted it out. We did the basement while they were still living there. They were pretty good to work with. Um, 
and they moved out in June of 2014, and then that's when we started gutting out the upstairs. And as you can see, we rewired everything, we spray foamed, we rebuilt different walls. I mean, we completely changed the way this house looked, but it was what we wanted. That caused a little bit of bickering between my husband and I, but in the end, we're still together. And on the right here is Jordan's shop. So Jordan, they do a lot of shop work in the wintertime, and so they were working on his dad's shop. So it was six miles away, so they had to go back and forth a lot, and he really wanted his own shop. So he started that process of building the shop. They did all the labor themselves. They, his uncle's a carpenter and kind of helped him get lined out, but they did a lot of the labor. So two-thirds of his shop is cold storage, and one-third is a heated part. And so they have a kitchen, an office, we have a bedroom upstairs. It's just a really, really nice shop. It's his dream shop. It's very useful. So we, as we were doing the house, we were also doing the shop, and I had two kids, and one was less than one years old. One was just born in um, May of 2014. So our life was pretty busy. And, oh, okay. So, now that we got moved over to a new place, we moved over there of um, February of 2015, right before we started calving. It has been the best thing for my sanity and our marriage to have our own place. I really like calving. I do all the night checking. Jordan does all the farming. We work back and forth, but we are um, kind of have our separate ways. I get to kick, pick out my own bowls. I get to keep my replacement heifers, and I don't bother him about the cost of what it costs to farm. <laughs> So we drag our kids with us a lot. We used to have a babysitter a couple days a week. My folks would take their kids on long weekends or when we had a big project coming up, they would take the kids for, for, to help us out. And, but for the most part, our kids are very active on our operation. My daughter loves horses, loves all things with four legs. Um, my youngest one loves to farm with his dad. He's out and about with him almost daily in the tractor. And my oldest one, he just kind of does whatever. He loves his chickens and his garden, and he'll ride if he has to. But they each have their own personalities and their own special skills. Um, they've actually already planned on coming home. They're going to call their farms the three C's, and they're, they're just the greatest. This whole time while we started, we kept continuing to grow our farming acres and our cattle numbers. It, it, was, um, it was a lot in 10 years, how much that we were accomplishing and how much we were growing. And it felt like sometimes we just lost sight of what was going on. But one of the most important things I tell anybody is have good relationships. Have a good relationship with your banker, with your agronomist, uh, with your equipment dealers, with the NRCS. Keep those relationships. Find somebody you trust and work really, really, really well with them. Um, our bankers actually here, uh, Dakota Bank is our banker and they've been with us for 10 years through the ups and downs. They've stuck it out with us. They've helped us grow where we're at now. The NRCS, we've had a lot of contracts with them, putting in water lines, cross fences, um, cover crops. Uh, we work with Gooseneck. Gooseneck is really good about finding us the equipment we need and when we need it in their parts department. It's just really important to find those relationships that help you um, do what you want to do. But we've always been over quality over quantity. So no matter how big we got, and we had to make sure that we were doing a good job of what we were doing. So we're, at this point, we kind of feel like we're, we wanna, we're done growing our cattle herd. If acres come up, Jordan might take them. But we, we started giving away acres that were far away from home or the soil wasn't as good. And we just try to stick with what we can do on a manageable level. And it's been really, really good. I, I don't know. I love our life. There's times it's difficult. There's times it's stressful. But for the most part, it's, it's been a wonderful life for us. Um, so and then of Conway quit nursing. He potty trained. Um, he quit needing to take so many naps. And then I realized I have all this time on my hand because I'm not dragging around a diaper bag and everything else that you knew to with little kids. So I started a Facebook page called JC Farms. I started this in November of 2019. I just get so sick of reading things about the egg industry that is false or misleading or somebody said it, so it has to be true, even though they have no idea what, what is going behind the scenes. And so we just kind of do, I just, I guess I kind of do a daily post of what's going on. We might do a video of harvest or I might do a video of pulling a calf. It's nothing like superstar or anything. It's just something I figured I had time to do 
and I wanted to be somebody that was a positive role model for the egg industry, somebody that will, you know, if somebody asks me a question, I'm more than happy to answer why we do it that way. If somebody said, well, you should have done it this way, I'm like, oh yeah, maybe that would have worked better. I don't know. You know, we live and learn, right? Um, my husband was not a big fan of me doing this, but now he actually kind of thinks it's interesting. Um, I get people from even in this area that will private message me and just tell me how cool it is that we're doing this and they really love watching our page. I have people that stop me on the street and just say, man, I get such a kick out of your kids. So there is so much positive that we don't see a lot of the, so when I see a negative comment, it just like hurts my heart a little bit. I'm like, why would you say that? But that is just people on Facebook, they feel like that is the way they can be. Um, one of my best comments is this guy, never met him, he's never met me, but he wrote, you're a shit farmer. Okay, well, thank you for your honest opinion about me. I mean, I'm not even sure why he didn't say that. I mean, I'm, like, I'm not whatever. But we also get a lot of people looking for work, and most of them are foreign guys, and I don't know how many messages I get asking if uh, we could get them a job. And that's not really what, I mean, we don't need anybody working for us. We already have our hired guys that are amazing. So I kind of feel bad for these guys because I'm sure their life is not great and they would like to come over to America. But um, So I just kind of say, I'm sorry, we're, we're just not looking for employees right now. But I do answer a lot of comments and I do reply back to most everybody unless it's one of those that you're a shit farmer, I choose, choose not to reply back to that. Um, I did set up an Instagram account and I thought about doing YouTube videos, but I realized all that takes a lot of time and the time is sometimes is something I don't have a whole lot of. So. I just do this Facebook page for the most part. I don't know if it does any good or not. It, it's interesting when you read comments and, and somebody would say something like, hey, I, I use that calf sled that you had on there and it works out amazing, I love it. You know, Because if I find something that I really like, I will be the first one to tell people, hey, try this out. This has worked really well for our operation. Um, oh, sorry. I can't go much farther. Okay, so, and I have always been a huge believer in cool country of origin labeling. Um, it's, you know, I think if you can label a apple and an orange, why can't you label your beef? I, it just doesn't make sense to me. And I get there's more to it than just putting a label on a package of beef. Um, but I've always been a big believer and I've always had in the back of my mind that someday I'm going to want to label my own beef. And it sounds great and stuff. Then COVID hit and the processing plants were starting to shut down and there was getting to be high prices and I decided now or never would be the time to do it. So we have this old building on our place. We had already spray foamed it when we first moved over there because we didn't have any heated buildings so we could park stuff or put some chemical and stuff in it. And so we, it was just now a storage. So we cleaned everything out of it and we turned it into a store and a walk-in freezer. Jordan's uncle is a very good carpenter, so he helped us build the walk-in freezer. We had it spray foam, Jordan's other uncle spray foams. It was not cheap. Um, there was a lot of paperwork involved in doing all this, but we have a really neat little store right on our place, and we use a bunch of recycled buildings for the store side of it, and it turned out really cool, and I was really happy with it. And so we, we, I looked up how to ship meat. So that took a lot of work because a lot of people use dry ice. We can't use dry ice because I couldn't get dry ice on a Monday morning when I need to ship the boxes. Things I've learned so much along the lines, things that I have learned is that shipping is not fun. <laughs> I do not like the shipping aspect because I have to get the, to Bismarck on a Monday and so it could get to them before, you know, by Wednesday or Thursday. It, but it has been fun process to do all this. The kids were a huge help. They helped me pull nails and these redwood boards. They helped me do the polyurethane. They helped me tear down old buildings so we could build this. Um, so we got this done and we took our first load down in August. We haven't really finished out more than just replacement heifers that were open. We'd finish them to finish and then sell them as quarter has and holes. So to sell by the package, I had to find a USDA plant and I found one in, um, Sturgis, South Dakota, and that's kind of, South Dakota is more of my stomping ground, so I thought, yeah, we'll go to Sturgis. It was three hours down there, three hours back, and an hour to drop them off and do the paperwork. So I was gone for seven hours just to drop a load off, and then three weeks later, I had to go back down with a little trailer and bring all the boxes of beef back. And then to unload them all, put them in the freezer, and then um, 
wait a day or something and go and start doing all the sorting. It was a lot of work, but it went really well that first load. So we went back down in December, did the whole thing, same thing again, and it sold out pretty good. I had a lot of good feedback, a lot of repeat customers. And then um, this guy came by and he was this, this guy from New Jersey, really nice guy, came to our farm. He was wanting to open a processing plant in Mott, North Dakota. It was only 25 miles from our place to where his plant was gonna be. It would just be perfect for us. So we thought, well, why not? So we kept 60 big steers. We kept, put them in two different pens. The biggest steers went in this pen and they got pushed harder. The smaller, younger steers went in this pen and they, we kind of just uh, grew them slower. And so in May of this year, we took our first load up to this new facility and we had them all finished, so we, we were ready to go. We were doing 10 at a time. And they, it was a brand new facility. A lot of people that worked there had never done anything like this before. And it was a train wreck. I'm not gonna lie, we did not have uh, the best luck. We were, I, we were expecting, I've cut meat up my whole life and we did the research. We figured from the hanging weight to the take home weight, we should bring home about 60%. There was some beef we were only bringing in the 30s, some in the 40s. We got lucky a few times to get to the 60s. Uh, at that point, we were losing money on the whole time we were doing all this work. I was working at the store three days a week, losing family time, not taking care of my cattle herd as well as I should have been. And it wasn't, they were very nice and they were great to work with, but they were not very organized. The cuts were very uneven. They didn't follow the cutting instructions. A lot of things were happening. I would, uh, email them or text them or call them and explain things that we we're having problems with. And finally, I just had to bring my husband. <laughs> Jordan is very, I'll tell you exactly how he felt about things. He's not one to, um, I don't know, worry about your feelings, I guess. So he came up with me and he's like, we, you can't sleep, you get headaches, like you're just, this is supposed to be a side hustle. This wasn't supposed to be this big of work process. So he said, we got to put a Band-Aid on this bleeding like right now. And I had already talked to Lemon Maid. It was really hard to find a butcher shop that had any openings at this time. And, and I had to finish out my early pen. I had to go through them because they were all ready to go. I was gonna take a butt kick in if I took them to the cell barn. So we just took the, what we had on our early pens, went through there, got them done. And then the later pens, we canceled everything. Jordan came up with me. We had a really good talk with the owner. He's a really nice person. He understood what we were saying. He was having the same issues with his own animals. He got it. And so we just said we can't, um, we can't come back until things are fixed. So the rest of our appointments we scheduled at Lemon Maid and they sell by quarter halves and holes. So they, I can't bring that meat back to our store. I can only sell it that way. They're state inspected, but they're one mile into the South Dakota border. So that didn't do me no good. And actually worked out really well. I got a lot of people would, uh, had bought, wanted to buy beef that way. So it did really well. I had five, I figured I didn't have sold and I, I hated to take them to lemon and then have to take that meat home and try to eat five beef in one year. And so I went back to the facility in Mott and they did just a way better job. They took our complaints very seriously. We got close, we got a little over 60% when we went back there. Everything was labeled right. They followed the cutting instructions. So they did really take my um, advice and the problems that we were having. They took us very serious. They worked way harder on our last load. And that's really good because I really like this, doing this, but I just didn't like the headaches and all the, the stress that came along with the, the summer. Um, so next year we plan on still keeping 2030 instead of 60, uh, drop our workload a little bit. In the process, I had I, my biggest client is a pastime steakhouse where I used to bartend. They are now our biggest client. They buy all the ground beef from us. They would do a steak special. It worked out really well for them. They said they got a lot of great feedback. It worked really well for us because they have something that's buying ground beef every week from us now and taking all the steaks. Not that it's very hard to get rid of steaks. Um, Over the Edge Cafe, it's in Camp Crook, South Dakota, kind of where I grew up. They also buy all the ground beef from us, but she does a lot of different cook, uh, different cuts, like the round steak. Not a lot of people want round steak. She does round steak, she did tip roast, she did some oxtail. So she's able to take more cuts and try different uh, recipes, which has worked really, really well for us. I, um, yeah, so making those relationships has really helped me because it helped uh, just sell more product that way. I do give them a little bit of a discount because they buy a bulk product 
but it, it works out really well. Um, like my grandpa, I am very active in our community. These are some of the boards that I'm already in the committees that I'm on right now. I'm on the NDSU advisory board. It's a really good board. It's, they have extension center down there. And so I just sit on the board and we just meet twice a year, kind of talk about the research they're doing, what maybe some of us uh, people in the community would like to see them try to do for research. I'm on the Dakota Buttes Visitor Council. That's just for tourism in Hedinger. Um, that one isn't, hasn't really quite picked up as much speed. They asked me to be on there because of my egg, my Facebook page, and we've tried to do some uh, little tourist things at our farm. So we, we talked about maybe adding more to that side of things. Uh, the Hedinger Youth Roadie Series, I just started that this summer. My kids are getting to that age where they're ready to rodeo and they want to rodeo, so I decided we have a really nice little arena in Hedinger, so that's just like once a month on a Wednesday night. And it went over really well this year, so we plan on doing that one again. The Adam County Fair and Rodeo, I have been on the chair on that one for 10 years, and that has really grown. We've done a lot of improvements on the arena. It's the biggest one-day rodeo in Hedinger. It's, it's really fun. It's a lot of work because it's in August, so we're also trying to combine at the same time. And then I'm on the chamber board, which has side committees for that board. Chamber is very, very active. It's, um, it's, it's a really good board. I like that board, but it takes a lot of my time. It, we meet once a month, plus I'm on like three different committees. Um, yeah, so I'm a really, really big believer in shopping local and keeping our small committees going strong. Um, I don't, I, yeah, I, so I, I really, I believe in everything I'm doing up here, so I continue to do it. I like to support the community I'm living in because they support us. They, you know, all these businesses, they actually, you know, sponsor all these kids' events and all these other events that we need to have in time, so, in town. Um, yeah, so each one has been fun, but it is time consuming. But my husband's like a, on the school board at the same time, so he's, he's really busy with that, but we both really enjoy it. I just want to say thank you. Um, if you guys ever have any questions, I am more than willing to visit with people about the farm to table thing. I know there's a lot of people who have talked about it, doing it, and they just need to know what it needs to do, or what they need to do to get it going. I don't feel like the need to be secretive about it because I think we need to, as an egg industry, stick together and work together on things and not just be, this is my deal, not your deal. So if you ever need anything, you can privately message me on my Facebook post or at my numbers on our Facebook page too. You can always give me a call. Um, yeah. Thank you guys for having me. I thought it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Oh, don't run off. We'll have questions. Oh, okay. Maybe. Any questions for Jackie? And if you do, I'll bring the microphone to you so we can capture that. Maybe not. Maybe you were right. So where does JC Farms come from? We are north, uh, sorry. We are northeast on Highway 8 of Hedinger, about 15 miles from Hedinger. So. Good. But what does JC oh. stand for? Jordan Christman. He actually started farming in high school and he named his own farm JC Farms. So I was thinking Jackie Christman. Well, he must know that he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I don't have my glasses on, but if not, I think we'll take a short break and at three o'clock we'll start with student presentations. Thank you.
All right, if you could make your way back to your seats, we'll get started. All right, have a lot to get done today, so if we could get started. We're going to start with our student presentations. We'll go through four of them. We'll have a short break and then finish up with the last three. Our first speaker hails from Watauga, South Dakota. Brandon K or Braden Cadis is presenting his senior project entitled Average Daily Gain of Purebred Angus versus F1 Baldy Steers. Braden. So before I get into what my project was about and everything, I kind of want to give a little background on what Angus and F1 Baldies are. Purebred Angus steer, it's a steer that has no crossbreeding in it. And then uh, F1 Baldy steer is a cross between a uh, black Angus cow and a uh, Hereford bull or vice versa, Hereford cow, Angus bull. And then I'm going to be referring to average daily gain quite a bit throughout the presentation. So that is how much weight the steer gain per day over a certain period of time. So a little bit about purebred Angus. The first Angus cattle to come to the U.S., they came in 1873. They brought four bulls over to the Kansas Prairie. But the first big great herds in America, they didn't come. They started in the Midwest, and they started with that when they brought over 1,200 head. And they imported them between 1878 and 1883 from Scotland. And then these early herds, they were kind of the foundation of how Angus got spread out through America at that time. A couple of reasons of why to use purebred Angus. They're known for their calving ease, and their calves are normally really well. Once, once the cow has the calf, they like to get up and get going right away. They're superb mothers with superior milking ability, and they have great maternal traits, early maturity and fertility, so they, they like to breed back quite really good. And the Angus breed is naturally pulled, so you don't have to worry about horns, so that's why a lot of people like Angus also. A little information about how the Herefords started. The first Herefords came to the U.S. in 1817. There was one bull and two females they imported to Kentucky. And then the first breeding herd was established in 1840 in Albany, New York. And more than 3,500 head were imported from 1880 to 1889. So that's kind of when most of the Herefords started in the U.S. So a couple of reasons on why you'd want to use Hereford cattle is they have greater weight for age and rate of gain in feedlots. They have greater economy of gain in feeding. The docility and ease of management, so normally you don't have to worry about getting run over quite very often. They have early maturity and longevity, so they also like to breed back very well. And they're very active and well adapted to almost all climates, so you can find them pretty much anywhere in the U.S. A reason here why you'd want to do crossbreeding is uh, heterosis. And heterosis is the tendency of a crossbred individual to show quality superior to those of both parents, so you get the best of both pretty much. And individual heterosis is measured in traits of survivability, growth, and carcass. And maternal heterosis is the results of the advantage of a crossbred dam above the purebred female in traits such as fertility, mother, mothering ability, and growth. So you're just kind of getting the best of both worlds. The purpose of the study was to look at the difference of average daily gain between a purebred Angus steer and a crossbred Hereford steer to decide if the crossbred steers would outgain the purebred Angus steers. A little bit on my procedures on how I did them. I used, I used two different groups of steers in this project. The first group consisted of seven purebred Angus and seven F1 Baldies. These steers were weighed two times 85 days apart. And then I had a second group of 16 purebred Angus and 15 F1 Baldies. And these steers were weighed three times total. The first weight was taken 107, 107 days apart. The second weight was 181 days apart. So they had 288 total days on feed. A little bit on what the feed, what we fed them, because they, they start out with a backgrounding ration, then went into a finishing ration. Both rations consisted of chopped hay, corn silage, dry corn, wet distillers, and medicated pellets for uh, bloat. 
Here's a picture of just what the finished ration looks like, it's mainly corn, and the rest is just kind of filler. And a little bit more on how it did the procedures in the first group here, the first group of steers, we weaned them, and then we weighed them for the first time on November 1st, 2020. Came right off the cow, ran up to the chute, weighed them. And then after we weighed them, we turned them out into the same pen for 85 days. So they're all in the same pen. And then we brought them back in for the second time on January 24th, 2021, to get their second weight. The second group, we did the same thing, weaned them, weighed them. We did this on November 15th, 2020 is when we got the first weight on them. Then we turned them back out into the pen again for 107 days before we brought them back in on March 2nd, 2021 to get their second weight. And at that time, then we switched them over to the finishing ration and turned them out for an additional 181 days before we took the final weight on August 30th, 2021. So they, they had the total feeding period of 288 days. And after collecting these weights, this is how I was able to determine my average daily gain between the two groups. The first group, when they were on 85 days of feed, they came, the crossbreds came in at 601 pounds, and the Angus came in at 609. And the final weight of the cross, crossbreds were 893, and the Angus was 895. And these ones were silent. I don't want to say that word. They have by what the p-value is suggesting, they are similar. There's no difference. And then for the gains, the crossbreds gained 292 pounds total, and the Angus gained 286. According to the p-value with 0.6, they were also similar. And then the average daily gain, the crossbreds ended up having an average daily gain of three and a half pounds, and the Angus had a 3.4 pound, so they're still similar according to the p-value. When I get to the second group, the beginning weight, the crossbreds came in at 432 and the Angus came in at 471. And then when we weighed them the second time, the crossbreds were at 766 pounds and the Angus were at 795 pounds. And at the final weight, the crossbreds ended up weighing 1,344 pounds and the Angus ended up weighing 1,335 pounds. But even, even though the numbers may look a little different, they are still similar. When you get to their gains, though, is when you start to see a little bit of a tendency to be different. Their gain one, that's still similar with 334 pounds to 323. But when you get to gain two and three, that's when they tend to be different. The gain two for the crossbreds was 578 pounds, and the Angus was 540 pounds. And the gain two, that was during the finish ration. So you can see the difference of gain there. And then gain three was overall from beginning to end, from beginning weight to final weight. And they gained 912 pounds for the crossbreds and 863 pounds for the Angus. So gain two and gain three is where they tended to be different. And then when you get to the average daily gain, the Angus gained on average three pounds in every part of the ration, each ration. And the crossbreds in the Back rounding ration, they gained 3.1 pounds per day. And when you got to the finished ration, that's where they gained 3.2 pounds per day. And that's where it looks to be, tends to be different with their p-value of 0.14. And then overall, from beginning to end, the crossbreds had a p-value of 0.15, so they tended to be different. So kind of a conclusion here, the data suggests that the first group was similar in average daily gain because they had a p-value of 0.6 and a difference in average daily gain of 0.1 pounds. And then in the second group was also similar in average daily gain during, during the back rounding ration with a p-value of 0.59 and a difference in average daily gain of 0.1 pounds. The second group of steers tended to have a difference in average daily gain during the finish ration, though. That's when their p-value was 0.14 and had a difference in average daily gain of 0.2 pounds. The second group of steers, they tended to be, tended to have a difference in average daily gain from the beginning weight to final weight also, where their p-value was 0.15 and a difference in average daily gain of 0.2 pounds. So kind of a summary by what the data is suggesting, the crossbred steers had a similar average daily gain in the first group and the back rounding ration of the second group. And during the finish ration of the second group and from the beginning weight to the final weight of the second group, the data suggests the average daily gain 
tended, tended to be different in favor of the crossbreds. Some acknowledgements, I'd like to thank the Dignan State Agriculture and Technical Studies Department for kind of teaching me to be able to do a project of this caliber and to go through the data like that. I'd like to thank Cadis Ranch and my family for allowing me to do the project at home with our own cattle and helping me get all of that data at home, taking the time for that. I'd like to thank Mr. Poland for helping me through all my data and helping me to kind of understand it more. Mr. Toby Stroh for helping me, keeping me on track throughout this whole process, keeping me close to deadlines. That's all not very good at that. And then I'd like to thank Mrs. Annika Plummer for helping me with my poster over here and making sure I did get everything done on time and tell me it was going to be okay. <laughs> and is there any questions? Now they were encouraged. They had to speak for 15 minutes or, or weather a, a period of time of asking questions. So he's certainly provided an opportunity. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Weights on yeah, the initial weights. What were your initial weights when you had the two different groups going in um, into both uh, sets? The first, the beginning weights of the second group was the ball. The crossbreds came in at 432 pounds, and the uh, Angus came in at 471. Pounds. Okay, is that typically where where you guys wean at home? Is that your typical weaning weight, or was this a um, was this an early wean situation? Or? Uh, no, it was typical because the group one was. Those were March-born calves. In group two, those were May to early June-born calves. So that's why they came in. That would be getting weights between the two groups were about 200 pound difference, just because the group two was younger when they came in, and that's normally what that's normally what they come in as. Okay. Do you typically background then at home? Yep, we background every calf, and then group two, our later calves, like in group two, we finish those at home. Because the group ones, those ones get sold in January after the back growing process, which they get up to about 900 pounds. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Certainly they have prepared, so there's nothing you could ask that they're not ready for. Uh, yeah. So based on your rations, is that typically what you guys are doing, or did you kind of adjust them? Um, to the different feed groups, I guess, for the different age caps? Um, that's the same, we do the same, basically the same ration for every pen, but depending on how big the calves are, they'll just get fed a smaller amount, depending on how big they are or how many are in the pen. So yeah, the, use the same ration for every pen of steers pretty much. They just change depending on how old they are and what they weigh. So I have a question. So. Anything that you've learned the last five years being up here in the program, what are you going to bring home that you think will benefit our um, calves and for our steers that we load out at the end? Uh, I think uh, the, let me correct. This is four and a half years, just so we got this clear. Sorry. <laughs> it's been uh, a long time. <laughs> I feel like the biggest thing I'll bring home was going to be like during Dr. King's classes and the feeds and feeding classes and then animal science classes with Toby is kind of learning more about making rations and stuff like that and knowing more what you're looking for in your cattle when you're feeding them and looking for sick cattle. And then, like I said, in Dr. King's feeds and feeding is learning how to make rations to your particular cattle and how they're going to gain and what they're cleaning up if you have to knock stuff down or put more feed into it. Anything else? Let's thank our speaker. Our next speaker hails from Flaxville, Montana. Got to get my notes put together here, right? Can you switch to yours, please? Mariah Linder comes to us as a transfer student from Miles Community, am I correct? Yes. yes. And her senior project is post-fire vegetation response in North Dakota Badlands. With that, Ms. Linder, it's, we're all yours.
Thank you, Dr. Poland. So wildfires, they're a pretty hot topic, right? They're thought of as highly destructive disturbances. They destroy homes and property with over 100,000 acres being burnt every year within the United States. They're also very expensive with over $1 billion of federal suppression costs every year. But wildfires are also a natural historical disturbance on our rangelands. And this has caused our plant communities and our plant species to be, become resilient and adapt to negative effects of the fire. So secondary succession is the basic idea of what is occurring after a major disturbance act, such as a wildfire. And this image over here on the left is what you typically see in an ecology textbook. But this does not clearly pertain to our grasslands because we're not a mature oak and hickory forest trying to return back to that. Most of our processes can be achieved within the three to four year time frame. So the effects of a wildfire is the removal of the senesced plant material, which is your standing dead growth, and then the removal of litter, and this leaves the soil exposed. And this affects the three processes of rangeland health, the hydrologic functions, the biotic integrity, and the soil and site stability. Um, our grasslands are typically able to reach the, their stable plant community quickly because of our vegetative reprodu reproduction of perennial plants. So the main objective of my study was to analyze how wildfire affected herbaceous productivity, community composition, and overall rangeland health across the landscape with the idea in mind to implement, implement a monitoring project that could be used as baseline data for potential future use, if so choose. So the fire in question occurred April 1st, 2021, just west of Medora. That same day, Governor Burgum issued a statewide fire emergency. The fire was 2,276 acres. I was granted permission by the Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation to conduct this study within their winter horse pasture. This pasture shown here in the black dashed area is about 120 acres and is home to 34, or about 35 horses in the winter months. Collection dates occurred at the Star, May 19th, July 18th, and September 6th of this year. So the first step to further narrow down the 120 acres, I took to web soil survey and found my dominant ecological site, which was the Badlands fan. So with the information from the ecological site description of a Badlands fan, I knew I was looking for the base slope from a Badlands escarpment at about a 15% grade and a plant community that was dominated with western wheatgrass and blue grama. So with that information, I took to the field and dug a soil pit and found a loamy, well-drained soil with the presence of calcium carbonates determined with one mole of hydrochloric acid. Then I ran a 100-foot transect and conducted line point intercept. Um, this is done by dropping a pin flag and recording each species intercepted and you record the first one you intercept and then so on and so forth. Also, any litter is recorded along with your soil surface cover. And this was recorded every one foot along the transect. Along that same 100 foot transect, I conducted soil stability with the soil stability kit. It's a modified method of a basic slake test. So this determines the integrity of your soil aggregates. I found on this site to have an average of five, which meant 25 to 75% of the soil remained on the sieve after five minutes of submersion and five dipping cycles. 
Species richness was also conducted on either side of the transect, which you can see here in the middle of the photo. And that is done by within a 15 minute time frame of just writing down any species observed within that time. The final method I used was total, total harvest, better known as clipping. And this was only done in September. I did six total hoops. So three hoops were for total production, where I took, for each hoop, I took everything within that hoop, put it into one bag, and then three hoops were separated by species. So for each species were put into their individual bags. These bags were dried at 140 degrees for 24 hours to obtain 100% dry matter. And then they were further adjusted for growth curve, grazing, pests, etc. So the results from line point intercept, this was the overall average composition, was a foliar cover of 76%, basal cover of 31%, bare ground at 17%, and litter at 12%. So for this chart, these were the count data of five dominant species within the transect. So the full colored bar it was the actual count, and then the expected value was based within observations and generalities within that data. And you can see that western wheatgrass was much higher than expected in May, and then lower than expected than in September. And you can see that it slowly starts to drop off, and that's primarily because it's a cool season species. Whereas blue grandma, a warm season species, was lower than expected in May, and higher than expected in September, and has the reverse trend of moving up. Species richness, there's many different ways to break down this data. I started with the monthly totals of May had 13 species, July had the most at 30 species, and September had 24 species. Then I further broke it down into their growth type. So the grass and grass likes had 13 species, your flowering plants had 11, and shrubs and woodies had six, and then one other lesser spike moss, your common club moss so that's found everywhere. Then I looked at what annual species might be moving in because this could be a concern following a wildfire. There was only one true annual out there, six weeks fescue. Next was introduced versus my native species. There was three introduced species, crested wheatgrass, Kentucky bluegrass, and then your common dandelion. And then warm season grasses, there was five. Blue grandma, little blue stem, plains muley, prairie sand reed, and side oats grandma. So total annual production was a little interesting. For the three total hoops collected and dried and weighed, I had 364 total pounds of production out there. For the, again, there was five dominant species that were individually weighed, and these equaled 296 pounds per acre, which was 81% of the total 100. Western wheatgrass, blue grama, and prairie sand reed in particular made up over 60% of the data collected for total production. So what does this all mean? That the biotic integrity was overall pretty well intact in that we had perennial native species that dominated the site. And the three introduced species are not of major concern, at least in my judgment. Kentucky bluegrass could have a potential but I think the wildfire maybe helped it by removing the thatch layer. Production was the most concerning factor for me, and I think I was fairly liberal in my calculations and adjustments. But for the Badlands Fan Ecological Site, there should have been 
1,200 pounds per acre out there, where I found 364. And this may have been due to the second disturbance that occurred out there, the drought that, was, that affected everywhere. So the typical precipitation for the area is about 14.86 inches per year. And this year we were right about eight. Um, you can see here in May is where we got most of our rain. And that was within a few short showers that came through and dumped everything. And that was all we got. Not the best way to get your rain. So the hydrological function was kind of interesting to look at on a Badlands fan. So the litter removal could potentially become a problem for the site, but that should hopefully build back up if everything else continues back to normal. Bare ground was lower than I actually expected out there, so that was good to see. And then water flow patterns are evident out there. There was rills, there's, this was, you know, but that is typical to see on a Badlands fight site. And so that brings to soil site stability. The soils were average at a five, which was incredible to see out there. I was shocked about that. But you have to keep in mind that a Badlands fan is subject to constant erosion and deposition of the site. So seeing things like this, isn't of major concern as long as management practices are in place to remediate any potential issues. I have lots of people to thank. So first, the Theodore Roosevelt Modora Foundation for allowing me to conduct this study. Dr. Poland for wading through the data and meeting with me every week. Mr. Stroh for keeping me on time. Dr. King for the GPS and showing me how to create a map. Uh, Miss Annika Plummer for everything she does for the Ag Department. And Mike Gerbig of the NRCS for constantly questioning everything I'm seeing out there and what it all means. And then Cindy Tussler of BLM in Miles City for teaching me most of the methods that I used for this project and always reinforcing the idea of identifying a plant, not recognizing. Questions. Questions for our speaker. Yes, sir. Well, we'll start with Ms. Tussler. No, go ahead. Go ahead. In the United States right now, we have we're in the middle of a large national debate about fires. Much of that debate has been about forest fires. Uh, but there's a debate about whether we handle fires correctly, whether we, uh, whether we should constantly put them out. Uh, what, does your, what did your study, uh, what, what would you add to that debate based on your work? Well, I think that that's very highly dependent on where you're at and what the management goals are for each individual place to start. For this site, I think it was actually okay. It came in, it removed some of the creeping juniper, opening up more room for the grass growth. And it removed, I think, quite a bit of the litter and the dead plant material that wasn't usable for grazing. So I think it was okay. I don't think this was a very severe fire, as in that it didn't burn really hot and destroy everything. So, yeah. Expand that conversation. How close did that fire get to Medora? And this interaction between um, urban yeah. life moving closer to rural areas and then the impact of fire? Well, that's the scary part about this fire is that it was right up next to Medora. They were trying to save the town and they evacuated at that time. And so first and foremost with any wildfire is safety. You know. <laughs> so Mariah, if you go back and look at your rainfall curve, go back, what, two slides. Is it? 
Yeah. Yes. Is there your answer there? Can you see your answer there for your production relative to the dominant species you found? What about yeah. your long-term average? What do you, how do you think that influenced with your major species? That's so moisture is typically a bigger component to production. I think that's kind of a general consensus within the people that study rangeland. And that with our, I'm sorry, well. What, what are your, you said you were surprised about the amount of production out there this year. And if you look at when we got our rain, y yeah, and, and your top, and what were your top three species in your, when you did by two, weight? Two of them are warm season species. Okay. Should you be surprised? No. Okay. It's concerning, but. Anyone else? Concerned, but yes. Oh, man. Okay, quick question, because I do remember the fire happening, and if I remember right, it was very windy yes, that day. I think. And so do you think a lot, I mean, it moved quick, and it was, like you said, it wasn't too severe because the wind was pushing it so hard. Um, do you think if it was not a windy day, would it, what would you predict for the severity of the regrowth? Oh, gosh, that, that's tricky, because without the wind, they may have been able to suppress it faster it wouldn't have been so hard to combat but yeah if the fire is not moving along and just taking moving quickly it would burn hotter sitting in place after, over time I'd imagine what was your favorite part of the project and what did you come away what knowledge did you walk away with Ooh. well I always like to say my favorite part is digging a hole <laughs> <laughs> and I just genuinely, truly enjoy being out on the rangeland. Um, I think my biggest takeaway was my production values because I, I did the double sample harvest method, but I did not use that data. Where That's where you go out and estimate it first, but I did not use that data, and I was actually within a few percentage points of everything, so except for thread leaf sedge. I learned thread leaf sedge does not weigh as much as I thought it did. <laughs> you hid data from us. Is that what you just admitted to? I, I didn't use my estimation. Anyone the else? actual numbers. Uh, we're far away around. So, just don't give it so I have a question. I don't know how this fire started, but... In the instance of like somebody trying a control burn and getting rid of some of that stuff like the litter and things like that, um, could that be a good thing versus seeing oh, what you saw? Absolutely. I think fire can be used as a management tool. You know, I think it's important to keep in mind that it is an option. It's usually not the first option for many people, but it was effective in removing a lot of the litter, effective in moving some of the junipers. So I think if you keep in mind that, you know, just put it in your toolbox, if you need to use it, absolutely. Of the plant species that you found, I didn't see any noxious weeds on there, but did you see any noxious weed infestations move in after the burn? Um, not necessarily on my plot, in the woody draw, there was leafy spurge, but I don't think I've seen a woody draw in North Dakota that doesn't have it yet, so. <laughs> Apparently sorry. Billings County isn't doing a very good job. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm sorry. She's being honest. In regards to your species richness, you said you took a 100-foot transect, but how far on that, off that transect did you take your species richness? About 15 feet on either side. You know, I mean, it's, I didn't measure out, but I tried to just kind of weave back and forth within a defined area just so that way I'm not, you know, it's 120 acres. I could have been out there weeks. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm already behind schedule. So let's thank our speaker. Thank you. I'm sure all the speakers will be around for a little bit if you have questions afterwards.
I'm going to be honest with you, this is going to be a treat for all of us. <clears throat> Allie's been away for a little bit, but has, has come back so that she can finish out this piece of the puzzle and be able to graduate with her bachelor's degree. Allie Brown from Berthold, North Dakota, has come back to talk to us about comparing the effectiveness of sun hemp and oats as a cover crop on manured and non-manured land. Ms. Brown. Thank you for that. So like you said, I grew sun hemp and oats to cover crop. To talk a little bit about sun hemp, sun hemp is a warm season legume, which means it has the ability to work with the bacteria in the soil to use nitrogen from the atmosphere rather than being supplemented by fertilizer. Um, this plant is primarily grown as a cover crop or as green manure but can also be utilized as feed for livestock or as a non-wood fibrous crop as well. Um, when it is used as a cover crop, it can help improve soil properties, reduce soil erosion, conserve water, and recycle plant nutrients. This plant is also fairly drought tolerant um, and it has no chance of becoming a weed in the northern part of the US. Um, it does not, grow, or does not produce seed north of the 20 degree north latitude which is just slightly north of uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, and is easily killed off by a hard frost. This plant is also not related to industrial hemp or marijuana. Uh, marijuana contains anywhere between 18 to 33 percent of THC and has a low fiber quality. Mm -hmm. And then industrial, industrial hemp has a high fiber quality and a low THC content, mm -hmm. which is roughly about 0.3 percent. And sun hemp, like industrial hemp, has a higher fiber quality but does contain no THC. Therefore, sun hemp is referred to as a hemp because of its high um, fiber quality. And you can kind of see the difference in the plant, I guess. Oats are a fairly common known crop, but it's a cool season annual that originated in West Asia. It can be grown as a cover crop, cash crop, or as a forage crop. When grown as a cover crop, it can improve the productivity of legumes when planted together, and it is also another fairly quick growing crop. So, cover crops are defined as the different crops grown together to enhance soil properties, such as reduce soil erosion, limit nitrogen leaching, suppress weeds, increase soil organic matter, uh, improve soil quality overall. In addition to the soil quality benefits, it can be used for grazing, for livestock, and for wildlife. So for this project, cattle manure was used, and cattle, man cattle manure contains plant nutrients and organic matter, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur, and the quantity of the nutrients really depends on like the feed that you feed your cattle. And then manure can also or can increase the plant nutrients, uh, or plant productivity, soil organic matter and structure, and water infiltration and holding capacity. There has not been many studies done on sun, sun hemp in the Midwest, so there really wasn't much to go off of. But the studies that I did find um, was all about nitrogen, how sun hemp can add nitrogen to your soil. So my objective for this was to compare the, compare the effects of sun hemp and oats grown alone and in combination as a cover crop on manured and non-manured soils in Western North Dakota. Limited on my procedures. Before seeding, I took three soil samples in each pass in both manured and non manured areas at two depths of zero to six inches and six to 24, so for a total of six samples in each pass. I then tested for soil fertility, percent organic matter, and soil pH. Then we planted one pass of oats, then one pass of sun hemp, and then a mixture of the two of them throughout the entire field. And then Due to all the rain that we had gotten in 2019 when this project was conducted after harvest, the um, soil sampling was repeated the following spring. And here is a layout of the field. Um, the whitened area kind of shows where all the manure was spread. Um, and then, oh wait, hold on. Okay, so this is the soil type where my soil samples were taken. 
we try to stay in the same soil type just because it kind of to keep the project a little smaller instead of doing it on a larger scale. But this is a um, Daglam Rose soil complex. It is a heavy clay pan. The soil is a level or a class four, so it's a very, very clay soil. Um, and this is just kind of represents on how the field was seeded. Sort of pass of sun hemp, pass of the mixture of them, and then the oats together throughout the field. You can still see where the soil samples are. Denier you procedures. Um, the nutrient analysis was performed at NDSU. And then the percent organic matter and pH analysis was performed at DSU. For pH, we mix five grams of soil with five milliliters of water and let it sit for about 10 minutes and I guess stirring it every 30 seconds. And then we used a calibrated pH probe to determine the pH. Uh, for the percent organic matter, the soil was dried overnight and then five grams of soil was taken from each sample and baked at 360 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours, and then the soil was reweighed to determine the percent of carbon lost. Now for my results. So there was no, for nitrates, there was no significant difference. And in the top zero to six inches, there was really no change from one spring to the next. Um, and then second depth, 624, it trends decreases from 2019 to 2020 except in oats grown in manure where there was really no change at all. But this could be due to nitrates are movable in the soil. So with all the rain that we had gotten in 2019, it could have just moved the, nit the nitrates lower in the soil or it could have been utilized by the plant as well. For NH4, um, again, there's really no significant difference that I had noticed, which was kind of surprising. but. And the non-manure, the trends lower, or trends lower, so it decreases from spring of 19 to sp spring of 2020. In the manure area, there again, there is no difference except in the combination where it significantly drops from one spring to the next, which you can see right here. In the six to 24, there is no notably, notably, no noticeably trends other than the combination, which is regardless of its manure status is another significant drop from one year to the next. For phosphorus, here's where we kind of see the most change, but there is still really no significance to any of it. Um, overall, the oats grown in the manure soil have somewhat higher levels of phosphorus the following year, which could be due to like the manure um, decomposing. And then in the manure soil, again, with the, whole, the hemp growing alone, it trends lower, but when it's grown in the mix, it trends higher, which the oats could have a potentially encouraging the manure decomposition. For potassium, there was really no significant or noticeable trends in terms of potassium. For pH, um, there's it, or it's usually in the shallow depths, the acidic is usually lower more acidic and the lower depths are more basic. In the top zero to six inches, oats are more basic, where hemp's are relatively unchanged, and then in the mix it trends more acidic. In the second depths of 6 to 24, in the combination, it trends more acidic, and there's no trends when for oats or hemp when grown alone. So overall, the mix creates more acidity at both the depths, regardless of its manure status. For soil orga gar organic carbon, there is no significant difference. Um, in the top zero to six, hemp in the manure, it ha shows the most change um, where it is lost from one season to the next. And in the six to 24, oats in the manure, most of the lost carbon is in, where is right here. Overall, everything else is relatively, mm -hmm. relatively unchanged. <laughs> so overall, there was no statistically significant difference detected in the majority of what we looked at, with the exception of phosphorus, but there is an interesting trends that warrant further research. And I'd like to thank a lot of people, too many to mention, 
but I'd like to thank Chip and Annika for both pushing me to come back to finish, along with my parents, my mom and dad both had a very big part to play in that. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Josh Steffen for allowing me to kind of hop in on the project and using his like, their land for the project. Any questions? Questions for our speaker? Corey is hoping you'll have a lot, so. <clears throat> so if you saw no statistical difference in everything, um, why would you want to, is it, does it take more to use the sun hemp um, as far as extra equipment, extra money? Is there any reason why you would want to use sun hemp if you, were you thinking you were going to find differences, or how did, how's this going to affect your management, I guess? Um, so in a cover crop, it's kind of nice. You don't really have to worry about it, the regrowth the following year. It does winter kill, plus it doesn't produce seed. So there's really no chance of it becoming a weed, which I know with some cover crops, you have to worry about killing it off before you replant the following year. Um, it is a fairly quick growing crop, and it is very adaptive. So it can adapt to any soil type that you have like the soil type that we use is a heavy clay pan and I was excited to see how well it did grow um, but it usually thrives in a sandier soil that was well drained so I'd be interested to see on how that what the difference would be compared to the clay pan versus its preferred soil type You don't have enough water. Anybody else? Yeah. Let's thank our speaker. Our last speaker for this session comes from Huntley, Montana. Corey Kistler, another one of those four and a half years, right? Uh, is presenting his, his, uh, his work, The Effects of Potassium Chloride and Sulfate on Millet Vegetative Growth. Mr. Kistler. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chip. So, a little bit about millet. It is one of the oldest human foods ever became of. It dates back to... 2000 BC in China and Africa. It is still one of the largest crops in Africa. And it was introduced into the US in the 18th century and further on moved to North Dakota in the 70s and 80s. It was the largest, North Dakota was the largest producer through the 70s and 80s. Most of that being for hay, but some producers were producing grain. North Dakota since then has ranged from 50,000 acres to 100,000 acres of millet every year. So I did my family of millet, type of millet, on proso millet. It is a grass crop mainly used for hay in North Dakota. But in other states, such as Colorado, it is produced for grain. And some, in some countries, it's still used for human food. But in the US, it is either the seed or grain is used for seed mixtures, bird feed. And in some instances, it is put into, made into bread like wheat and other instances made in brewed for beer like barley. And it has a very high nutritional value for livestock, especially cattle and swine. The crude protein on an average proso millet crop is 12% with all your B vitamins in that, along with the crude fiber being at an 8%. My objective of this study was to, to, derm, to determine the source 
what source of potassium and at what rate would millet thrive the best off of and measuring that on the development and growth of my plants. Um, in my, pr my procedures consisted of planting seeds, 75 seeds per pot, and at seven treatments, four pots per treatment, that equal to 28 total pots. And each source, one is potassium chloride, KCL, and potassium sulfate, K2SO4. And the levels of these, my control is at zero, 15, 30, and 60 millimolars. Here's a more on my treatments. KCL 15 is 1.1 grams per liter of water. KC KCL 30 is 2.24 grams per liter of water, and 60 is 4.8 grams per one liter of water. K2SO4 has 2.62 grams per liter of water of potassium sulfate, along with the level 30 being at 5.23 grams per liter of water, and at the level 60, K2SO4 has 10.4 grams of potassium sulfate per one liter of water. These mixtures, these solutions were made in liter increments, and the chemicals were put into a soluble form because they were in solid form before they were mixed with water. On mon Monday, September 6, 2021, my, I treated my plants for the first time. Each pot got 100 milliliters of fertilizer per pot, and I measured height in centimeters and leaf stage in numbers for example, if it was in the second leaf stage and shooting its third leaf, it was in the two and a half leaf stage. I continued this every Monday until October 4th, 2021 is when I did my last treatment and uh, took my last measurements. And then on that Thursday, I harvested by clipping all my plants at the soil surface on that Thursday. Why does this matter? Um, I, I wanted to measure the development and growth of the total amount of production through my millet plants and I wanted to fulfill, uh, I wanted the treatment to fulfill the, the genetic potential that my crop had. In this graph, I show the weekly measurements, the average of each treatment, and all of these are weeks one, three, and five. There is no difference in, no statistical difference within the measurements, but week two and four, there is, and it tends to be different. This is highly weak, weekly heights at three different levels, 15, 30, and 60. As you can see, there was no difference in week one, but after week one, there uh, is a statistical difference in the heights. Throughout this next graph, we, I measured the height and in weeks two, no, yeah, weeks two and week five, there is a statistical difference and it tends to be different, and weeks one, three, and four are, have no difference. 
as you can see, the dotted, gra dotted bar on weeks four and five stick out more than weeks all the other bars and show to me what is uh, growing at a higher rate and a higher stand. Next I did the leaf stages between the two treatments and in this there is no statistical difference. Leaf stage at the three different levels throughout the last two th last three weeks there uh, is a statistical difference between the three different levels giving a p-value less than 0 0.01 and weeks and the leaf stages of each treatment there is no statistical difference and I did the only the last three weeks of leaf stages because at the first two weeks the plants were at a not there was no difference throughout any of the leaf stages until week three that's when they started to separate results over the growth period of five weeks the research and study shows that the correct amount correct amount of potassium is crucial in the growth rate and development of prosomillet. And my study suggests that the level 30s are the correct amount of potassium. From what I've really learned, and I thought the higher the amount of potassium would be the higher amount of vegetation growth, but through the research, the KCL potassium chloride level 30 sample taken on October 4th, 2021, overall produced the greatest amount of vegetation. Therefore, this is the best level and treatment to, to fulfill that genetic potential. I'd like to thank Dickinson State University for allowing me to do this project and teaching me how to analyze everything and what nutrients I needed to needs to use. I would like to thank Dr. Poland for helping me through all the data and getting me lined out on everything. I'd like to thank Mr. Stroh for keeping me to deadlines. I'd like to thank Dr. Josh Steffen for setting up this project for me so I can complete it. And I would like to thank Ms. Annika Plummer for keeping treats and coffee, all the criticism, and the keep me on those deadlines. And I'd like to f thank my family for helping me through the struggles and keeping me through these four and a half years, keeping me in school. Any questions? Good, any questions for our speaker? He is prepared, believe me. Ah, John. You stated that the KCL30 was the best treatment for production. Did you do a cost analysis to see if KCL was the most cost effective for growth? No, um, no, I did not do that end of the whole perspective on a farming perspective. This was just done in the greenhouse, so it was, at that point it was, cost effective because basically they cost the same and but I have not done the cost. Only a banker would ask you that. But. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Let's thank our speaker. <laughs> and you kept us on time. We'll take about a 10 minute break and we'll start back at 4.15.
How are you? Yes, you. All right, our next speaker comes to us from Beach, North Dakota. Sister is an alumni, and I think mom is in the audience as well. Uh, Katie Lofsgaard is going to talk to us about her senior project, The Effect of Prairie Dog Towns on Vegetative Density in Western North Dakota. Ms. Lofsgaard. Vegetative cover. Vegetative cover, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Poland. So, my study was conducted in Western North Dakota in the northern corners of Golden Valley and Billings County. Uh, Black-tailed prairie dogs have been present in North Dakota since 1954. In 1998, the U.S. Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service got a petition requesting they be protected under the Endangered Species Act. It, that act, addition to the Endangered Species Act caused controversy in the West because they are seen as agricultural pests for they can take over cropland and cattle compete with them for forage. It wasn't until 2004 when they were removed from the Endangered Species Act for their rapid reproduction growth. There are a few other studies that are similar to my project. The University of Nebraska did the prairie dog and the prairie ecosystem where it explains the roles prairie dogs play in an ecosystem. A group from the University of Arizona did black-tailed prairie dog effects on Montana's mixed grass prairie and those results were um, characterized by, an in, by a decrease in plant species litter, big sagebrush canopy and density, and an increase in bare ground. Wendy Sweetie with Progressive Cattle did, the, did a study where prairie dogs can take half of the available forage from cattle and how to manage rangelands that are occupied by prairie dogs. Uh, South Dakota State University, Pat Johnson student, did a study on the effects of prairie dogs on plant community composition and vegetation disappearance on mixed grass prairie that concluded that there was a shift in the plant species composition to plant species that were undesirable for livestock grazing and that the vegetation due to clipping was shorter on prairie dog sites than other rangeland which would reduce um, availability. The object objectives of my study was, the primary objective was to determine if the pressure of a prairie dog town affects the proportion of land covered by plants and or litter. The secondary objective was to analyze if the pressure of a prairie dog on the proportion of land covered by plants or litter is influenced by whether the prairie dog town is considered a thriving community, a newly established community, or a community recovering from treatment. So to start off with my project, I chose three prairie dog towns that were considered a thriving community, a newly established, and a recovering community, as well as choosing three off-town locations that were based on the same topography. And then to mimic the natural resources conservation range plant identification method, a transect line was used, and um, where a point was was felt, it was recorded as hits, misses, or litter hit. So each location, the on town and off town, had three transect lines. My transect line was 50 feet long and points were dropped at five foot intervals. So there was 33 total data, data points at each location. Uh, a hit was recorded when it hit a plant and a miss was recorded when it hit bare ground and a litter hit was when it hit litter. And litter is the freshly fallen, slightly decomposed vegetation material that sits on top of bare ground. So a thriving community for this project was a community that had high prairie dog activity over a certain time. These two pictures show the visual difference between the rangeland and the community, as well as showing the similar similarity between the um, landscape. The newly established community was was the community that the prairie dogs had just began to invade and they were taking over the rangeland and again these pictures show the difference and the similarity between the two. The recovering community was a community that was had been under control and the range run was starting to come back after prey dog activity. And these pictures show 
the similar and the different, the similarity and the difference between them. So this first graph compares the number of hits on rangeland and a prairie dog town. As you can see, there will be more hits within rangeland and less on prairie dog towns. The second graph compares the number of misses on rangeland and in the prairie dog town. Prairie dog towns will have more misses and less hits compared to rangeland. However, the colony did not affect the number of hits and misses because of the significance of their p-values. For this ex experiment, p-values less than 0.05 indicate a significant difference. Values between 0.05 and 0.16 are considered to indicate a tendency towards differences, and values greater than 1.6 are considered not significant. So generally, for these first two graphs, there will be more hits and less misses on rangeland, regardless of the location. My next three graphs will show the number of hits and misses at each location for Prairie Dog Town and Rangeland. The first graph shows the effect of a thriving community. Thriving tended to have fewer hits and more misses. The effects of an established community. And the effect of a recovering community. Regardless of colony status, the corresponding rangeland had more hits and fewer misses in prairie dog colonies based on their p-values being less than 0.03 for all of the three graphs. In prairie dog towns, thriving communities tended to have fewer hits and more misses while recovering communities were more evenly dis distributed. On corresponding rangelands, recovering sites tended to have more hits and fewer misses to other, compared to other sites. Although the absolute difference may change within the prairie dog town status, that pattern is consistent through all three. My last two graphs will show the percentages of hits and misses within the prairie dog town and the rangeland. My first one will show the percentages of on a prairie dog town. Within a prairie dog town, the recovering community had a more evenly distributed number of hits and misses compared to the thriving and newly established. The last graph shows the percentage of hits and misses on the corresponding rangeland at each location. As you can see, there is an inconsistent pattern, inconsistent pattern pertaining to the number of hits and misses within the rangeland. With p-values of 0.13 and 0.16, these graphs are considered to indicate a tendency towards differences. So in conclusion, prairie dogs do affect the the vegetative cover because they reduce the number of hits and increase the number of misses in a prairie dog town compared to the hits and misses on rangeland. However, the status of the prairie dog town does not affect the overall number of hits and misses within the prairie dog town, and the presence of prairie dogs reduce vegetative cover, and vegetative cover is increased in towns that are recovering from control compared to towns that are considered thriving. Some implications for my project were that this year the whole state experienced a drought according to the North Dakota Climate Bulletin. The average temperature was 3.9 degrees warmer and accumulation was 2.7 inches less as well as North Dakota facing the sixth driest nine month period from December 2020 to August 21 since 1985. Also, my project was constricted to the soils that are found in Northern Golden Valley and Billings counties. And the results of my project relate to the University of Arizona and SDSU, where it re they prairie dogs reduce availability and increase bear ground. At this time, I'd like to thank my whole family for their support, Dr. Chip Poland for analyzing my da data, Ms. Annika Plummer for everything she does for our egg department, and Mr. Toby Stroh for keeping us all accountable during this semester. Are there any questions? Very good. Questions for our speaker? I was given a note that some people weren't allowed to ask questions, but I can't read my writing. So. <laughs> Dr. King. Now, when you're talking hits and misses, do you keep track of your hits and misses with your rifle or just the misses? <laughs> no, just on the transect line. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be kind of sad. Uh -huh. I'd be pretty disappointed. Anyone else? Let's thank our speaker.
The next speaker is not very far from home. She hails from Manning, North Dakota, just north of town. Olivia Kuderna is here to talk about her senior project, Bridging the Rhetorical Gap Between Agricultural Producers and Consumers. Ms. Kuderna. Today, less than 2% of the overall population is involved in production agriculture. Most of America has been raised to believe that if they need food, all they have to do is go to the grocery store or even have pre-made meals delivered to their door. Modern research has exposed that agricultural, agricultural literacy is decreasing rapidly. At this point, no primary or secondary education framework requires students to understand basic agricultural knowledge. Health classes ensure they understand basic food proportions and nutritional needs while leaving out where those nutrients come from. Thanks to the advancing of technology, most of us have the ability to look up any question we may have and have results within seconds, including those about agriculture. The only problem is ensuring the reliability of those sources. As of 2021, the average American spends four hours on social media alone every day. Digital media has now become the primary form of media in America. And this is why so much of the, of the population is unfamiliar with agriculture practices. And so it's important to, excuse me. Digital media has become the primary source for information. So many of the population use their social media browsing as their source for information on many topics, including those that should only be publicized by an unbiased, reliable source. Much of the population is unfamiliar with agriculture and its production processes, and this is why it's so important to understand where consumers are getting their information about agriculture. My intent with this research was to further understand or identify the role media plays in the separation between producers and consumers in agriculture. Only after completing a required human subjects training course and being approved by the Dickinson State University Institutional Review Board, I constructed a survey on Google Forms which consisted of 14 multiple choice questions and kept its participants completely anonymous. I was then given the task to distribute the survey. It was copied by a link and shared on my personal social media accounts, as well as through the DSU email server to DSU staff and students, as well as a few local businesses and personal contact organizations of the co-investigator. I had a total of nearly 450 results, and for data analysis purposes, a p-value of less than or equal to 0.05 will indicate statistical significance. The first question I asked my participants was, what is your age range? 47% of my total demographic was between the ages of 18 and 25 years. The next question was to specify the gender, and then select the location that best describes where they currently live. This was split into a city above 2,500 people, below 2,500 people, as well as rural. The next question was, where do you primarily get your overall information? As you can see, 56% of the total demographic responded social media was their primary source for information. The next question was, where do you primarily get your information about agriculture specifically? Word of mouth came in with 31%, followed closely by social media with 21%. The next question I asked was, is nutrition important to you? 75.5% said yes. Are you directly involved in production agriculture? Are you concerned about the use of antibiotics in the production of meat? Do you think agriculture largely contributes to climate change? Do you believe in the use of genetically modified organisms in crop production? Would you consider yourself for or against entirely organic food consumption? How do you feel about plant-based alternatives to meat and cultured meat? The last question I asked my participants to answer was, do you feel as though you've been properly educated on where your food comes from? 
75% said yes, while 25% still responded no. Due to time restraint, I'm going to focus your attention first on the effects of agriculture information. According to this p-value on the bottom left of my chart, where does where they get their information about agriculture affect if they feel if they felt as though nutrition was important to them? The p-value does indicate a statistical significance here. Does where they get their information about agriculture affect if they're concerned about the use of antibiotics in the production of meat? And there was no statistical significance found between these two factors. Where they get their information about agriculture and if they believe that agriculture largely contributes to climate change, there was a statistical significance found here. Of my responses between social media, print media, television, radio, word of mouth, none other and the internet, none would be the response that they did not receive any information about agriculture. And that response group was more likely to answer yes to if they believed agriculture largely contributes to climate change. Does where they get their information about agriculture affect if they believe in the use of genetically modified organisms in crop production? And there was no statistical significance found here. Does where they get their information about agriculture affect if they consider themselves so for or against entirely organic food consumption? There was no statistical significance either, here either. Does where they get their information about agriculture affect how they felt about plant-based alternatives to meat? There was a statistical significance found here. That same category I'll direct your attention to again. The none category was more likely to support plant-based alternatives to meat. Does where they get their information about agriculture affect how they felt about cultured or lab-grown meats? And there was a statistical significance found here. A similar category to the one previous, that none category would be more likely to support it as well as respond I don't know, including internet was more likely to choose I don't know as well. Does where they get their information about agriculture affect if they feel as though they've been properly educated on where their food comes from? And there was a statistical significance found here. That same category of none was more likely to choose no, that they don't feel as though they've been properly educated on where their food comes from. This next factor I'm going to direct your attention to is going to be the effects of age. Does age affect where they get their information? So there was a statistical significance found here. The younger demographic tended to lean more towards modern sources like social media, whereas the, the older demographic tended to lean more towards sources that were traditional, like television and the print media. Does age affect where they get their information about agriculture specifically? As you can see, most of the demographic chose that word of mouth was their primary source for agriculture information, and that older demographic still tended to lean on modern sources, or traditional sources, like print media and television. Does age affect if nutrition was important to them? There was no statistical significance found here. Does age affect if they're directly involved in production agriculture? This data suggested that the younger demographic was more so involved in production agriculture, while the older demographic was less so involved in production agriculture, which actually contradicts modern statistics, saying that the average age of the producer was 57 and a half years and continues to go up annually. Does age affect if they're concerned about the use of antibiotics in the production of meat? There was statistical significance found here. The older demographic, was more so was more so concerned about the use of antibiotics in meat production compared to the younger demographic. Does age affect if they think agriculture largely contributes to climate change? There was no statistical significance found between these two factors. Does age affect if they believe in the use of GMOs in crop production? As you can see, the most common answer for this was yes, but the older demographic tended to lean more towards no. Does age affect if they consider themselves for or against entirely organic food consumption? There was a statistical significance found here as well. And the older demographic was more so for organic uh, food consumption. Does age affect how they felt about plant-based alternatives to meat? There was a statistical significance found here as well. 
and as age effect, how they felt about cultured or lab-grown meats. There was not a statistical significance found between these two factors, as well as does age effect if they felt as though they'd been properly educated on where their food comes from. There was no statistical significance found here either. I know I shared tons of charts with you, and just to keep you in line with what I want you to take away from this, age really does affect where people are getting their source for information on many different topics, especially those about agriculture. The younger demographic tends to lean more towards the modern sources like social media, whereas the older demographic is more comfortable with their traditional sources like print media and the television. Social media is your most popular source for primary information, and the word of mouth is the most popular source for agriculture information. And that source of information genuinely affects individual beliefs about agriculture. I would like to give a big thank you to Chip Poland, as well as Toby Stroh, Annika Plummer, and Deb Nelson from DLN Consulting, as well as a huge thank you to everybody who participated in the survey and shared the survey. Without you, it would not have been possible. For more information on the categories I couldn't share with you due to time restraint, please request a copy of the paper. Did I have any questions? Questions for our speaker? Oh man, they all go up at once. <laughs> we'll go with her and work our way back. You know, the other speaker, Pat John. Yeah, I know. Got a little cred there, huh? <laughs> So your uh, um, survey showed that um, age, the, the age uh, breakout relative to who was involved in production of egg. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you got something that countered what I think we all know is the national trend? Yep, I thought that was very interesting. It might have just been um, because of the way the survey was actually made public due to social media tends to draw towards that younger demographic, as well as being in the egg department family. We shared it through, this, through the DSU email, and so a lot of that younger demographic was likely to be involved in production agriculture, just due to location. So uh, aside from that, that sort of, um, surprise about, uh, about age uh, uh, and involvement in production agriculture. What was the second most surprising finding to you? The second most unexpected finding? Um, I don't know if I have a second most. I really enjoyed doing my analysis and being able to compare the numbers from where they got their information, what their primary source of media was versus their beliefs specifically about agriculture. It was very interesting to see, like I pointed out, that none category, people who didn't receive information about agriculture, they were less likely to understand some of those, those questions that for some of us seem rather basic, but to some people who are further removed from production agriculture can be somewhat complex. Any other questions for our speaker? Hello. Um, from what you showed us today, what do you think, taking away from all of this, what do you think would be best in the source of social media or papers to actually get information out in the future? What, would, what do you think would be best going forward? to actually tell people about it, being there's only, people have no idea that it's only 2%. That's, mm -hmm. that's huge. What do you think would help us? So personally, I love to see whether it's a small family farm or a large production, sharing it on media sources like social media, like we saw with Jackie. I think it's very impressive that she went out and just started sharing the the small things like some of us who came from production agriculture pulling a calf, you don't really think that's anything to be shared, but it can be so construed when you're looking at some of the media that doesn't understand a lot of these processes. So I think the more we can speak out about it and the more we can share to try and overcome some of these, these skewed factors would, would help. So the, like what Jackie's doing, sharing on her social media pages and just getting the information out there. 
As you stated, because of your route of distribution and who it was distributed to, do you feel that that maybe skewed your numbers, you know, to those surprising results because it was sent out to like-minded people like yourself and everyone who is here? And how could you get better information through distributions to get maybe in more of the urban places where we're battling these issues? And that's a great question, actually. Um, that was something when I went through and analyzed the results because it was, it was a strongly female demographic. It was strongly 18 to 25 year olds and a lot who were involved in production agriculture and aware of a lot of the production processes. I think with distribution, we did our best to avoid any specific demographic. So we tried to send it to places that weren't agriculture based as well as those that were just to keep it even. Um, so we did try to keep it as well distributed as possible just based on who we know and being out of the egg department it did it did tend to lean more towards those who were already familiar with some of this stuff so yes it I do think that had it played an effect in why people responded the way they did for those questions. Thank you. I can honestly say we went to great pains to get it in front of as many people as possible. Pretty sure and I don't think we've ever seen over 400 responses to a survey that we've tried to, yeah. to do. Any other questions? I want to take a moment to thank everybody for coming, not only being here today, but staying to the bare end. Uh, there are a few more treats over here. Ag Club has a Friendsgiving supper, so if you'd like to spend some time with us, uh, certainly wander your way across. I don't think the wind is quite as brisk as it was. President Easton. Oh, man. I'm ready to go eat. <laughs> yes, we do. No, 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 no. We have one more. <laughs> That was, and she was not even stopping me. It's a good thing President Easton is here. Yes. Can we edit that out? Yes, our next speaker hails from Beulah, North Dakota. You ready? No. Hit OK. Our next speaker hails from Beulah, North Dakota. Mariah McLaughlin is going to talk to us about soil characteristics along an abandoned mined Katina pre-1980s. Ms. McLaughlin. Yes, thank you, Mr. Poland. So as Chip said, I looked at an abandoned mine Katina, and a Katina is basically a fancy word for a hill. So anytime I say that word from now on, you can basically just think of how a hill affects soil development. So just to give you a little bit of an idea before we get into the nitty gritty stuff, this was the size of the hills I was working with. There's a little pickup right there. If you guys can't see, I'm sorry. Um, but these were man-made spoil piles uh, from a mining process. And it's just, they were huge. So these spoil piles were from a mine called the North Beulah Mine that was operated by Knife River Coal Mining Company that began as an underground operation in 1922. Within 10 years, they reached peak production of employment. And they had 220 men that were producing 230,000 tons of lignite coal a year. They were chasing a coal seam that was four to six meters or 14 to 21 feet in depth. And everything happened on a really slow basis. Again, this is 1922 that we're talking about. So you had miners that were hand loading every piece of coal that was being taken out of the mine into this trolley system that was then moved by a mule right here, you can see. And so everything happened on a really slow basis. In 1950, they decided they wanted to do some modernization and they hired a contractor to do strip mining right next to the underground mine just to see what would happen. So they had this drag line here that would, has a bucket on it that's 17 cubic yards. So obviously a lot more material is getting moved 
and a lot faster process, and things were happening a lot better. So by 1953, they realized that there was that difference in production and they could get a lot more accomplished. And so they discontinued the underground mine and the underground mine ended up turning into a strip mine as a whole. In 1974, they decided that the resources had been exhausted, there was no more coal to be chasing there, and so they abandoned the mine. When they abandoned the mine, they planted it back in a reclamation a lot of the mixes are introduced grasses, purely because they're a lot cheaper than native grasses. So there was a lot of smooth brome planted there just to try and minimize the um, erosion that could happen from how steep those spoil piles were. They then donated it to the state and it's now used as a wildlife refuge. So the objective of this project was to determine what the impact of the Katina or the hill is on the soil development in approximately the last 50 years since these places were abandoned. As you can see here, this is just an aerial picture of the spoil piles themselves, just to show you how extreme they were, as you can see, like the, the big shadows being cast right here. They're very intimidating looking hills. So I took samples along what's called the, so the parts of the, hill or the summit, the shoulder, the back slope, the foot slope, and toe slope. I took samples along the summit or the top of the hill, the back slope or the middle of it, and the toe slope and the very bottom. So I took samples at this site right here, and then a little bit further down, and then a little bit further down. I took three transects that all were on convex slopes with a cottonwood growing at the bottom of it, trying to keep things as similar as possible for scientific research purposes, trying to keep a proper triplicate. So I took two sets of samples. One set of samples was taken with this AMS Ready Driver power probe, and the other set of samples was taken with just a regular back saver soil probe. The samples that were taken with this big probe, it was two inch core in diameter, and those samples we used for um, horizonation, we looked at your soil aggregation or how that soil naturally clumped together. And then we also tested that for calcium carbonates within the soil just using a one molar solution of hydrochloric acid. When you um, put a dot of the hydrochloric acid on there, if it bubbles, it means that there was calcium carbonates in the soil. The results or the the samples taken with the regular probe were sent to Eggvice Soil Testing Laboratory for analysis of pH, base saturation, calcium carbonate equivalent, texture, and organic matter. Not all of these tests were considered significant at the end portion of it. Um, things like base saturation would have came in handy if we had sodic affected soils, but we didn't have sodic affected soils. So those results, they're still there, but they weren't as um, shown up in the results as things like the organic matter percentages. We really didn't know what we were going into when we started the project, so we wanted to make sure that we had all of our bases covered, so we ran all the tests. So when you look at the results, I had statistical significant differences in everything that was highlighted, except for this organic matter, which is in a different color over here. And I highlighted that one because it's not what we expected walking into the project. You would think that there would be more organic matter at the bottom of a hill because you're going to have a lot more growing at the bottom of a hill. You've got a little bit more moisture down there naturally and it's, it seems like it would be a better place for vegetation to be growing. But that was not in fact the case in this scenario. We had more organic matter at the summit of the hill and that can pretty much be attributed to the fact that if you remember back with the shadows on those hills, there is not much photosynthetic capacity at the very bottom of those hills. There's not much sunlight reaching them, and so it's hard for your plants to be growing if there's not much sunlight reaching them. Um, your potassium, calcium, sodium, and cation exchange capacity all kind of follow more so like a water table sort of differences within the soil. Um, the reason why like the back slope with your potassium here and your sodium were a little bit higher than what they were in the toe slope was probably because we had microclimates because along those hills in order to stand and take those samples themselves we had to find a little bit of a place where we could get a footing which in 
made it to where there was a microclimate, which can indicate and skew those results a little bit right there. So then we also tested everything by depth. So the, the zero to six samples, the six to 12 and the 12 to 24 inch samples were all tested and analyzed against one another. So in this one, we did see the organic matter differences that we expected to see, as well as your potassium, magnesium, sodium, and cation exchange capacity. And the reason why all of those would be, be higher in the first six inches of your soil is because that's where you've got living organisms. You've got roots that are giving off those root exudates and feeding your microbes. And there's a lot more happening in that it, couple inches of the surface than when you're down 24 inches down and there's not nearly as much happening. So we actually went through and had a um, taxonomy. We did official taxonomy classifications on these soils as well. So we found oustorthin soils along the back slopes as well as one of the summits, the, the very first uh, transect. I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, but the oustorthin is basically a fancy word that can be broken down. So the oust means that we're in an oustic moisture regime. We're in an arid to semi-arid environment. Obviously, we're going to have an oustic moisture regime. The orth means that there's steep slopes or parent material that doesn't break down. In this case, it's going to be the steep slopes that are just showing you that there's not going to be that same development happening there as there would be on a flat area. And an entosol is the soil order that it is. And that's basically the largest classification of soil there is. An entosol means that there's not much happening for horizon development. As you can see in this bottom picture here, I just took the NRCS standard picture for entosols. You can see that this is the soil surface and there's not much happening from up at the surface to down below. There's, there's not a color change, there's not a structure change. It's just there. It's a very, very young soil. So then we also had haploostepped soils in the more what you might consider stable positions of the soil. So your summits, um, your bottom or your back two summits had haplo step soils, as well as all three of the toe slope areas. So the hapl means that it's a freely drained soil. The oustic, again, we're still in an oustic moisture regime. And then it, these were actually classified as inceptosols, which basically means that it is a young soil, but there is horizonation happening. There's development, there's something happening from up here to down here. As you can see, there's, there's roots, there's color change. You can see there's a change from up here to down here. So this is just, an, again, that aerial picture trying to show you where I found what. So the oustorthens were up here. This is the one summit that was an oustorthen. And we believe that the reason why that could be is because you're at the very end of a hill. So that's going to get pounded by your elements, your rain, your snow, your wind, all of that kind of stuff. And all three of your back slopes were relatively young soils that did not have that horizonation happening. Whereas your summits up here, and then all three of your toe slopes had a little bit more of that soil that had horizonation happening on it. So North Dakota as a whole is um, usually classified as mollusols as a general characteristic sort of a thing. And mollusol means that it's a grassland soil. They're very good development. That's why farming is so good in this area is because mollusols are very productive soils. So the goal of this project was to see if in the last 50 years, not only what the effect of the hill was or the catena was on this soil development, but also if they're making their way back to what they would be in a natural, in a natural form. And they are making their way back there. It's a very slow process. On a flat surface, one inch of soil development takes over 100 years. And in this, we've, we're just under 50 years. And we are seeing development. We are seeing horizonation. It is making its way back to um, the mollusol. So I would like to thank Dr. Chris Augustine, who helped me out with all of this, as well as Dr. Chip Poland, who helped me do statistics and understand what the statistics meant, as well as Mr. Toby Stroh, who again kept on me about deadlines. Lanny Mayhaft sifted through countless hours of information trying to get me information on um, the mine itself, and North Dakota Game and Fish for letting me on their land to take 
the samples themselves. Any questions? Well, questions for our last speaker. I understand your research was more specific towards soils, but during your soil samples that you took your soil cores, did you notice any difference in your root, um, your vegetation root? Did it, any of it go down past six inches or the top two inches? Did you have any root development there pushing were. in down farther? There was not much. So the very bottoms, the, there was the cottonwood tree, which obviously is going to have a little bit more roots than a grass sort of a thing, but there, there wasn't much happening past about three inches for your root space. There was, I mean, even like your aggregation, there wasn't much for aggregation down there either. I mean, that, that first little bit definitely had some happening. There was stuff going on, but down deeper there wasn't anything. Okay, the mine was abandoned in 1974. When did the reclamation laws and rules in North Dakota come into effect? Initially, 1977, and they've been revised since. And that, well, North Dakota had rules set in place as well as, like, that 77 was when the federal ones came in, and that's when everything really started happening. And then in... A couple years after the initial mine, Surface Mine Reclamation Act, they did create like the abandoned mine portion of things where they began to use money and reclaim the land that had been abandoned beforehand. Because like for instance, this mine, there was at one point an 80 foot drop off right off the side of the highway right there. And they, that was kind of dangerous if somebody gets in a car accident and goes off the road, there's an 80 foot drop. and not going to end well for you sort of a thing. So they did start to do a little bit of reclamation there in like 94, 95. Any other questions? Um, you're from the Beulah area. So you go right, reach the Beulah about a mile on the south side of the highway. You've got this unreclaimed look like mine that's all solid trees. How can those trees thrive like that if the soil has been, I'm assuming, is still all underburden subsoil? Uh, well, there, so this is, that, that is this. That oh, is really? this area right here, yep. Um, it, trees sometimes have a will no. to live. Like, so, like sometimes they do and sometimes right. they don't. Well, I find it amazing. It almost looks like they've been planted. They're just solid They native. were, there was a lot of trees planted okay. by the Boy Scouts. Okay. I never knew that. Yep. Okay. Um, in the, in part of the initial, like, abandoning of okay. the land, they did bring in people to plant some trees. Okay. That would make sense. Yep. <clears throat> Anyone else? Now let's take a moment to thank all of our speakers. And I want to again thank everyone for staying to the very end. And if you're still hungry, there's treats over here as well as Friendsgiving if you'd like to partake later on. Thanks again, and we'll see most of you next year maybe.